Imagine you've got an implantable, like a pacemaker inside of you, and it's got a vulnerability where someone can wirelessly hack it and shock you to death. So now as a patient, you've got to make a decision. Do I get this thing taken out of me, which is a pretty major surgery, or do I live with the risk that someone could possibly wirelessly connect to my pacemaker and shock me to death? Are you looking for free tools that accelerate your business? Try self-implementing Summit OS, the ultimate business operating system. Summit OS will help you empower your team, execute like hell, and dig a moat around your business. Go to stevebreda.com tools and download free, simple worksheets that help you grow your business. Alternatively, get matched with a Summit OS guide and take your business straight to the top of the mountain. Good day, dear listeners. Steve Preda here with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And my guest today is Christian Espinoza, founder and CEO of Blue Goat Cyber, whose mission is to assist medical device manufacturers in creating products that are not only innovative, but are also secure and compliant with regulatory standards. Christian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to have you and uh, to learn about Blue Goat. And I love the blue shirt that goes with it. Actually, the goat is white, but I guess the cybersecurity is blue rather than red. So my first question is, what is your personal why and what are you doing to manifest it in Blue Goat Cyber? So a couple of years ago, I developed six blood clots in my left leg and almost ended up dying. And that was something that was a pretty pivotal moment for me because before that I had done 24 Ironman triathlons and was in really good shape, but I didn't think things like blood clots happened to people like me. But when I was in the hospital, a Doppler ultrasound device that was portable was used to quickly diagnose the blood clots. And after going through a pretty long bout of depression, because my life as I knew it changed completely, I couldn't exercise, I couldn't fly, I, I couldn't really do anything but sit around. After I got through that, I decided to start another business and focus on medical devices because in my first business that I sold in 2020, we did medical device cybersecurity, but it was part of what we did. And now the, the focus is on medical device cybersecurity with this company. And, and largely, I think, you know, things happen for a reason. And I often think if that device had not existed or had been hacked and taken off the market, I may not be here today. So my mission is to help these innovative products get to the market and help them stay on the market because they're hack proof or secure from hackers. Wow. I didn't realize that this is such a big issue in medical devices that they get hacked and then mm -hmm. they, they, they lose their FDA license or, or why do they disappear? Can they not just be fixed like any software product? Uh, they can be fixed, but a lot of times they're recalled. Like pacemakers have been recalled. Imagine you've got an implantable, like a pacemaker inside of you, and it's got a vulnerability where someone can wirelessly hack it and shock you to death. So now as a patient, you've got to make a decision. Do I get this thing taken out of me, which is a pretty major surgery, or do I live with the risk that someone could possibly wirelessly connect to my pacemaker and shock me to death? You know, I don't have a pacemaker, but if, that, if I was in that scenario, that's a tough decision to make. But yes, these things are are hackable, and the regulatory authorities, like the FDA and the in the Europe, the um, medical device reg regulations, are making efforts to enforce security with medical devices now. Wow. Okay, so this is a huge thing. Uh, I didn't realize, and obviously, it's it's like there's not not much room for error uh, for medical device security. It's not like your computer. In the worst case, you get hacked. You have to pay some Bitcoin to get rid of the hacker, but you're still alive. But a medical right. device is, uh, you know, you don't get these second chances. So I now get it that it's it's super uh, important. So how do you make a medical device uh, hacking proof? How do you create that level of certainty that it will be uh, secure? So ideally, that is designed into the device. So if a manufacturer like works with us very early on in the design of the device, then we can design cybersecurity into the device. Unfortunately, what happens most of the time is the device has already been developed and they forgot about cybersecurity until the very end. And then we try to like bolt it on or tack it on. 
uh, which doesn't always work. Sometimes they have to redesign it the proper way. But yeah, the, the, the whole idea is design it in a way where the cybersecurity risk is low enough where if somebody does do something, it can't affect a patient. Because even with things called like IVD or in vitro diagnostics, which make decisions on someone's like blood and what bacteria they have, if somebody can alter the algorithm and give a false negative or false positive result, let's say your blood has sepsis and the device says you don't have sepsis and the doctor doesn't treat it, you could die as well. So, you know, we want to make sure that those things are very unlikely to happen. You can't always get rid of all the risk, but the job is to get the risk to an acceptable level. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about frameworks and you are developing these uh, cyber secure medical devices and you developed a unique project management process, which you call the efficiency driver uh, or something similar. And mm -hmm. I was wondering what triggered you to invent this process and what does it do? My first company, I made a lot of mistakes and I had people on typical salary. So they got paid a salary you note know, for no matter how efficient or inefficient their work was, they got the same salary. So then I thought with this company, I'm going to change things up a little bit. So I pay people a, a, like a base salary, but the majority of the pay is based on a project. So what I do with our clients is we do firm fixed price with our clients. So if our clients pay us, let's say $100,000, I d divide it up into my team. And what this has done is my team can take on more and more projects, which means they can make more and more money if they become more efficient. So it's really driven a lot of enhancements and improvements in our delivery mechanisms, our communication mechanisms, how the team works together, how projects are divided up from a, a racy perspective. And I've, I've noticed a great improvements because my team wants to make, you know, everyone, most people want to make more money. And if I give them an incentive to make more money and the way to, for them to maximize that to become more efficient, then they're going to find ways to become more efficient, which is the opposite of salaried um, employees from my experience. Okay. Or even hourly. Hourly, there's no incentive. There's actually more incentive to become less and less efficient because you work more hours on something, you know? Yeah. So uh, is there a flip side to this? Are there risks that might arise because of this approach that wouldn't otherwise be so prevalent? There might be a flip side. I haven't seen it in my organization, but the flip side that I can see or, it, it, you know, or keep an eye on is people becoming a little bit sloppy and just trying to get something done as quickly as possible and mm. skipping things over so they can do multiple projects at once or you know, maximize the money they make by doing as many projects as possible. Mm -hmm. We have controls in place to prevent that. We have quality assurance and quality control. So I haven't seen that, but you know, that's something I have to keep an eye on, of course. And then these people, how do you build some kind of team culture? So when people are working on specific projects and it's completely kind of a uh, result-based uh, commission, but well, it's not a commission because it's not a sales job, but yeah, yeah. is there a way to still kind of summon these people into your organization or it's more like an intermediary between independent contractors and kind of a general contractor to put these projects together and you'd not, you don't really intend to build a blue goat cyber culture? Yeah, the, there. I do intend to build a culture and I have a culture and I think culture is extremely important and it's something you have to work hard to keep the culture and enforce the culture and hire the right people that meet the criteria for the culture. So the culture that I want to have is everyone has a growth mindset and they want to grow with the organization. They want to take ownership over projects. They are constantly learning and they want to improve. So all those things tie into uh, this efficiency driver and us becoming more efficient. And it also helps in the long run because if we become more efficient and our projects become better documented and better templatized, then it reduces stress and ad hocness on the team. The team knows exactly what to do. They feel like it's well oiled, it's well greased. They feel like they have an opinion to make it better, the process better. That opinion is welcome to be heard. And, and that's the culture uh, I want. And it also incentivizes people to kind of put their life in their own hands. Uh, they're not just tied to a uh, a nine to five typical job with a salary. And then every year you get a, you know, two or 3% raise. This allows them to 
put some more of the ownership and agency in their hands to say, I want to take on more projects. I want to help make these more efficient so I can make more money than, you know, 2% raised from last year, for instance. Yeah, I mean, that's that's great. That That's a good way to attract uh, those A players, high performers who want to work like that. Obviously, not everyone wants to work like that. It's it's It can be tough, but for those mm-hmm. that, that can thrive on this, it's, it's, it's a great way to attract them. So... You you have uh, authored, uh, Christian, several books, and, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, you wrote a book which was The Smartest Person in the Room. What was this about, and why did you write it? What was the premise of the book? That book is about my entrepreneurial journey with my first company in cybersecurity and high-tech industries. People feel significant by being you know smarter than other people. And what I realized in my first company, and this ties to culture, is 99% of my problems were because my staff didn't have emotional intelligence. They had a high IQ or high rational intelligence, but lacked emotional intelligence. So they would talk over clients' heads. They would you know, argue with each other about who is smarter about something. And it, this all came to a head to me once when I heard one of our clients' recordings. The client was not getting what my engineer was telling the client. And then I talked to the engineer about it, and he said, they just don't get it. And I'm like, the client's a doctor. It's a doctor's office. We're cybersecurity. We probably don't understand what they're doing. So we need to explain it in a way they do get it so they can actually become more secure. And that was sort of the pivotal moment for me that made me write the book. And the book is based on what I did in my organization to add that emotional intelligence to the already highly rationally intelligent individuals. And and not everybody was on board. Uh, I talked about enforcing culture earlier. I had to let some people go. They simply did not want to develop emotional intelligence, which is bizarre to me because I like to improve in various aspects of my life, but I I have to come to terms with not everybody wants to improve. So how can someone uh, build their emotional intelligence? What is the process for that? Uh, I have a seven-step methodology I wrote about in the book. I can quickly run through the seven steps. Uh, The first step is awareness. Uh, Everything starts with self-awareness. I'm not talking about being aware of everything else. And in the book, I talk a lot about neuro-linguistic programming. We're actually very predictable. We have these programs in our brain that given a stimulus or trigger, we automatically run the program and we don't even realize it half the time. Uh, And that's a strong neural pathway in our brain. So once we have the awareness of that, we can do something about it. Like if we find ourselves in the same situation over and over, like somebody asks us something, we automatically get defensive, then we get an argument. You know, there's a way to reprogram the brain. And that's the awareness though. Uh, But the awareness has to be actionable. A lot of people have awareness, but they're unable to do something about it. Uh, The second step is mindset. So I'm a believer in a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. A growth mindset means that we can change. Our brain has neuroplasticity. We can learn new things. People that have a fixed mindset will say, that's just the way I am. I can't change. That's just who I am, Uh, which, you know, is not not good for like my culture. I want people that are willing to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, The third step is acknowledgement. One of the things I realized as a leader is I was horrible at at acknowledging myself for my accomplishments, which meant when I reflected on it, I was horrible at acknowledging my team. Mm -hmm. I remember in a... 2005, I stood under the finish line of the Ironman World Championship in Kona, Hawaii, and I told myself I would do that race someday. I have a picture of me under the finish line, uh, just standing there. And then in 2015, I actually finished the race. So 10 years later, I finished the race. And I remember finishing the race, and I was automatically thinking about the next thing to accomplish. I never once took a moment to like congratulate myself or appreciate uh, what it took me to get there. And I realized I wasn't doing that with my team either. Mm-hmm. The fourth step is communication. Communication is a big topic, but I'm a proponent that the meaning or the purpose of communication is the response you get. So if you're not getting the response you want, which could be the budget you want, the answer you want, the person is not understanding, the ownership shifts back to you to change or alter how you're communicating so it resonates with the person you're communicating with. Mm. And, And people rarely do that. We have to just blame the other person. Like my engineer did when they said, he said, they just don't get it. Mm-hmm. He should have made sure they got it. I mean, that's that's our end goal at the end of the day is to help people become more secure. Uh, and then s- step five is monotasking. So monotasking is the opposite of multitasking. It's doing one thing with concentrated effort or focused attention. 
Um, I think multitasking is horrible. It makes you very busy, but not very productive. It makes you very anxious because you're always on the edge for the new text message, the new email, the new Instagram alert or whatever. Uh, and monotasking helps with two things. One of them is being present. So if I'm monotasking, I'm not thinking about anything else and I'm conversing with someone or having a conversation, I'm present. And that improves your relationships. The second thing is it helps you uh, become much more productive. If I can block out an hour of time on my calendar and just do one thing, like turn off my phone or put it on silent, turn off Slack, turn off WhatsApp, <laughs> whatever, just do one thing, I'll become much more productive. And, and that's how I schedule my day with, in blocks of time. Mm. And then the sixth step is empathy. So in, in our society today, we have a lot of division. We constantly focus on what's different about us. There's the you know pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, the Democrats, the Republicans. You know, there's all these different like factions, and it's hard to be empathetic when you see yourself different from somebody else. For me, this kind of struck home when I was in the hospital when I had those blood clots because I, I I don't know anything about blood clots. I've never had them before, and the doctor told me I had six blood clots in my leg. And I asked him, I says, what does this mean? And he said, he told me it means I could I could die or have a stroke any moment. So I was there alone. I didn't have any family members near me. And I was kind of freaking out, started crying a little bit. And he said, kind of in a very dismissive way, he's like, he's like, don't worry about it. I see this all the time. And it kind of like snapped out of my like feeling, you know, my life was over stage. And I'm like, you know what? I don't see this all the time. This is a first for me. I think he was trying to be empathetic, but it felt very demeaning, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, that goes back to him seeing himself as a, a doctor and me as a patient versus we're two fellow human beings. You know, it's again, yeah. that division. Yeah. And the last step is uh, Kaizen. Uh, Kaizen is a Japanese word that means continuous and never ending improvement or constant improvement. I, I think with anything in life is we're not going to master it overnight. We have to take the steps. And some of the steps might be in a slightly wrong direction, mm. but we will, we will know that if we take the steps. So I'm a proponent of Kaizen and, and developing the courage to take the first step and realize that this is a process. You, you're going to learn along the way. But if you wait for everything to be perfect, you're never going to take that first step. And that applies to pretty much everything in life. Yeah. And then you never know. You, you never learn because you don't uh, put out impulses which can, can elicit a response and you have no response. You have no information and you're not learning. And that's a fascinating uh, process. What I'm not sure I understand is do you say all these seven steps make someone more emotionally intelligent by practicing like monotasking? Uh, is it because you're more present, you're more emotionally intelligent? Yes. Yeah. And the Kaizen, how does that make me more emotionally intelligent? So one of the, the things I notice with, because my audience for the book is highly rationally intelligent individuals. One of the things I noticed is they would try something and if it didn't work, they would give up. Like they would try to learn how to communicate better or try to learn how to build rapport as example. Mm -hmm. And then if it didn't work, they'd be like, see, I told you that this wouldn't work or they would give up. So I, the whole philosophy of like, it's, a, it's an opportunity to learn about what aspects of what you tried did work. Uh, and it may take you a hundred times to learn this, this skill and you may get worse before you get better, you know? So it's, it's trying to apply that philosophy. And, and the same thing with monotasking, I'm a believer in checking in with yourself which means you have to silence the dialogue, the inner dialogue, all the noises around you, and just sit with yourself for a while. And that helps the emotional intelligence as well as that being present part. If I'm monotasking and I'm with somebody or communicating with them, I'm going to be a more effective communicator because I can see how they're responding. I can you know, be, be present and be quiet and listen more and just create the space for a better dialogue as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I recently realized that I thought that when I take notes, I'm actually being more present because I acknowledge that the person, what the person is saying is important because I write it down and mm -hmm. uh, I pay attention to it. But now that we have uh, AI, which is a note-taking AI, and I started using that, I actually realized that I can be much more present in these conversations because I don't have to take notes. I don't have to look down and I don't have to think about how to summarize the thing in verbal form, I can and I can be more present. That is, that is very true. Very interesting. I mean, I could ask a million more questions because uh, <laughs> it's a fascinating topic. However, I'm going to ask you a, a closing question, which is more an open one, which is, what is the most important question that a business owner should ask themselves? I think the most important question is, what is the problem 
they solve and who they solve it for uh, and being able to distill that down to a very succinct message. That's a challenge, I think, a lot of business owners. And it needs to be your price point for your service needs to be in alignment with how big the problem is you solve for people. Wow. Okay. I like that. And it's probably a question that is worth re-asking every now and then because something that maybe looks like a unique solution, it can get commoditized over time. It can get disrupted. And That's right. you wake up one day and you no longer are creating as much value as you thought you were. And then the market can just go away from you. Yeah, that is fascinating. Uh, Christian, if someone would like to learn more about you know, what you do for medical devices, how do you make them more secure? Maybe they have a medical device. They want to build a cybersecurity into it from the get-go, or they just want to learn more about uh, Blue Goat Cyber or yourself. Where should they go and where can they find out more information? Yeah, they can go to uh, the website, uh, bluegoatcyber.com. We're also on all social media. Uh, LinkedIn's a good one as well. Um, if they want to learn about me personally, they can go to my website. It's christianespinoza.com. My books are on Audible as well as Amazon and, and most bookstores as well. Okay, well, uh, definitely check out Christian uh, Espinoza's books. He also has a book in between. We didn't have time to cover this in this episode, unfortunately. And you you got four other books, so you it's like six books, right? <laughs> also on medical yeah. devices. Christian wrote a book. So if you want to dig deeper into how these devices can be secured, then probably you can you can read his book about that as well. So if you enjoyed this uh, this episode, don't forget to subscribe and like uh, the episode on YouTube. Uh, follow us on uh, on LinkedIn and uh, give us a review on Apple Podcast. And Christian Espinoza, founder and CEO of Blue Goat Cyber, thanks for coming and sharing your wisdom and knowledge on the show. And thanks for listening.